the concept uh, of sovereignty, um, like all concepts, is actually a product of its history. But I'll try and begin by saying something about it in the abstract before um, getting into um, a sort of longer view of its development. Sovereignty is regarded by um, modern lawyers and uh, political philosophers as a fundamental feature of the modern state. Um, and when I say a fundamental feature of the modern state, I mean a fundamental feature of um, modern unitary states um, and federations. Um, so uh, recently it's become a particularly controversial uh, issue, partly because um, where there are states and there are movements for secession from those states, um, there is implicitly a claim on the part of the uh, secessionary power, a claim to, a rival claim, if you like, to sovereignty. So sovereignty is therefore fundamentally a sort of politically contested um, property. Similarly, in federations, there is often, very frequently, some um, controversy about the bearer and location of sovereignty. And that has become um, particularly controversial recently in relation to the European Union, which is often seen as um, a struggle over the nature and location uh, of sovereignty. So anyway, that's the, as it were, sociological reality which we face. Um, but what is the underlying concept? Well, um, sovereignty is often seen as a, a sort of conceptualization of power, um, but I think this isn't quite correct. Um, sovereignty is fundamentally a legal notion. Um, it's the theory of um, the final decision-making um, mechanism within a political community. So if you think of um, a political community as having various authority and decision-making structures within it, um, sovereignty is usually um, thought of as the final tribunal the overarching jurisdiction under which, um, uh, which, which as it were, um, arbitrates between subordinate jurisdictions. So those, the phraseology I've already used tells you something about the concept, um, jurisdiction and subordinate jurisdiction. Um, uh, you can see from that that it's essentially a juridical or legal concept. Um, however, um, it operates in the world of power politics and therefore becomes associated with the world of power. So um, people in claiming the right to sovereignty often think of themselves as uh, seeking to claim or acquire powers. Um, uh, so recently in the United Kingdom, the debate over um, Britain's relationship to the European Union has very much been conducted um, around this debate. And the expectation was that in reclaiming sovereignty, the British would be able to reclaim some species of power. Um, and of course, it may be the case that um, uh, when Britain no longer has any relationship to the European Union, it may have more power in all sorts of ways, or it may have less power in all sorts of ways. Um, but in reclaiming its sovereignty, it won't be reclaiming its power, because what it would be reclaiming is final, um, a final right of jurisdiction, um, but it will be um, its government will be practically dependent on all sorts of other powers in the world. It'll be practically dependent upon the opinion of its population. It'll be practically dependent upon all sorts of international treaties. It will practically dependent, be, de, be dependent on all sorts of international legal bodies. So it won't have any more power um, necessarily, uh, although it will have final jurisdiction. So final jurisdiction doesn't equal power. That's the fundamental point that I'm making that uh, sovereignty is a legal notion, a juridical notion, not a practical political one, although these two things are often uh, confused. The um, term has a somewhat long history, and rather than who coined the term, it might be worth saying who made the term famous, really, or who gave it its greatest currency. And um, the figure who did that is undoubtedly Jean Baudin, uh, who uh, was a 16th century French uh, jurist and humanist uh, who lived from 30, uh, 1536 to 1596. Uh, and in saying that he was a jurist and a humanist, 
By that I mean he was on the one hand a legal scholar uh, and at the same time sort of uh, philologist or commentator and translator of um, classical culture. Uh, so when he coined this uh, new concept, the concept of sovereignty, um, as a result of his philological training, he was very much interested in relating it um, to um, classical terms and notions, specifically Greek and Latin ones. So Bodas notion was that all languages had a, both the word for and the concept of sovereignty, but although they all had it, um, uh, the Jews had it, the, he the Hebrew language, as far as he was concerned, had it, uh, medieval Italian um, had it, and, and very crucially for him, the ancient Athenians and the ancient Romans um, had terms uh, for it. Um, uh, his point, however, was although the Romans had a word for sovereignty, let's say summum imperium, and um, although the Greeks had a term, uh, kurion arche, uh, sort of preponderant rule, we might tr tr translate that as. Although they had these words, the Greeks and the Romans had never properly understood it. So they had a, they had a term, but they didn't know how to use the concept. And um, here we see um, Bodin's um, philological and juridical training coming together. Uh, they had a term, but they didn't have the practical wherewithal to know how, how to use it, and he was going to show them how to do this. Um, so in order to do that, he came up with his own definition of sovereignty. And sovereignty, as far as he was concerned, should have four properties. Um, uh, a so sovereignty should be um, supreme, um, it should be um, absolute, um, and it should be um, perpetual um, at the same time. Now, in saying it should be perpetual, that meant that um, the body that had, so had sovereignty should be um, a sovereign for all time, perpetual in that sense. Um, as regards a supremacy, uh, the supreme sovereign uh, should have no superior. Um, and as regard its um, absolute characteristics, it should not be it should not be accountable to anything um, else in the Commonwealth. These characteristics were especially fundamental to the notion uh, of sovereignty. And um, then that the final, the fourth characteristic, which I haven't yet mentioned, I mentioned three, the fourth characteristic is that it should be indivisible. So it's probably worth explaining um, why he's preoccupied with these um, attributes. In saying that it was supreme, he was thinking of the 16th century French monarchy, and he was trying to communicate the idea that um, supreme power could not be um, dependent upon other subordinate um, corporations within the state. In the, in the case of France in the 16th century, um, other legal bodies like the Parlement. At the same time, uh, sovereignty had to be absolute in the sense that um, it couldn't be a called to account to uh, another um, body in the state, for instance, the people. There was no right of resistance against the sovereign, is what he was getting at there, because if the people had a right of resistance against the sovereign, then they would be sovereign. Um, uh, equally, what we've dealt with, it's being perpetual, that's rather straightforward, the, the, you know, the king is the king for all time. Um, and then it's indivisibility is the more controversial and complex aspect. Basically, Bodar wanted to argue that um, there was no such thing as a mixed sovereignty. Uh, and here he was very much challenging the views of um, um, Aristotle. Aristotle had the view that um, there were different functions in the state which would be, could be held by different bodies. And as far as Bodin was concerned, this was a recipe for political disaster. Indeed, it was a recipe for civil war. So these, this notion, this concept, sovereignty, and its properties were then taken up by other um, theorists in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and perhaps I'll say a little bit um, about that subsequent transmission then. Um, but first of all, I should pay, make one very important point, and that's that although Bodin was particularly interested in monarchical sovereignty, it was absolutely fundamental for his theory to make clear that other forms of regime also had this property of sovereignty. That's to say, you could um, have an aristocratic sovereignty and you could have a democratic sovereignty. Um, so there were three different kinds of sovereignty, but those three different kinds could not themselves be mixed. So different kinds of sovereignty could be located in different regime forms, but those regime forms in turn could not be um, mixed. So that's his fundamental view. 
And this um, proved very attractive to the 17th century um, uh, political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who um, uh, resuscitated and redeployed, if you like, uh, this concept of sovereignty as, again, having these uh, properties um, essentially as being indivisible and absolute. They were the, these were the most important characteristics um, um, for Hobbes. And Hobbes, um, again, accepted that you could have different um, uh, types of regime in each of which uh, sovereignty um, would be um, located. Uh, but again, for Hobbes, um, monarchy was a preferable um, regime. Though in the 18th century, one of um, Hobbes' most influential readers uh, was the um, Swiss political thinker Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Rousseau um, took forward uh, the notions that sovereignty was absolute and indivisible, but he identified these characteristics above all with popular sovereignty, not with monarchical sovereignty. In fact, as far as Rousseau was concerned, and this is a key move in his political theory, there was only one form of legitimate sovereign. So just to go back a bit, you'll note that, as I said, um, as far as Boda and Hobbes were concerned, there were three different possible types of legitimate sovereign, uh, a democratic sovereign, an aristocratic sovereign, and a monarchical sovereign. As far as Rousseau was concerned, there is only one legitimate form, a democratic sovereign or a popular um, sovereign. Um, anything else is usurpation. Um, so uh, this is a sort of fundamental um, um, innovation, if you like, to argue for the fundamental legitimacy of an absolute and indivisible popular sovereignty uh, or democratic sovereignty. Then this obviously becomes itself a very um, influential and fundamental theory and in various complicated ways feeds into modern political thinking, um, not least of all because in rather intricate ways, Rousseau became an important player in the French Revolution and therefore his thought as translated both by other thinkers and by its being transmitted through the processes of practical struggle in a revolutionary circumstance um, or conditions um, becomes a part of our modern political vocabulary. So uh, sovereignty and popular sovereignty remains part of our political world uh, for those reasons. As I said at the beginning, uh, sovereignty is a fundamental part of our world and um, we shouldn't expect that to go away anytime soon. Therefore, um, it's reasonable to expect that sovereignty and um, struggle over the location of sovereignty is likely to be a part of the future. Um, this is clearly um, the case in um, um, Europe generally, because there's no prospect of um, strife over the character, composition, and location of authority within um, the European Union going away anytime soon. Um, but of course, it's not just uh, Europe in which this is uh, an issue. Uh, the Russian Federation, it's clearly going to be an issue because wherever you have um, secessionist pressure and debates over the relative uh, location of power vis-a-vis -vis subordinate jurisdictions, you are going to have debate about um, um, sovereignty. I also am inclined to believe that um, the confusions about sovereignty are likely to be part of our future. That's to say, uh, the confusion between it as a juridical or legal notion and um, our tendency to um, um, uh, can blend that into a sort of concept of power. Um, as I said, that's not going to end any anytime soon, although to get a proper handle on that would be very useful going forward.